Hello and welcome back to the Dividend Experiment, the channel that can help you build a portfolio that pays your bills. Every three months we come back to the Dividend Experiment and we see how everything's coming along. This update's quarter is going to be long like all of them now as the portfolio is growing each update. But anyway, let's get into the exciting stuff. In these videos I'll do a summary and update on how the stocks are doing in the portfolio and how they're performing. I'll also let you know my thoughts on the future of the stocks, if there's any interesting news, and if I'm going to sell anything or have sold anything in the time between the last update video, or maybe even have bought anything in that time too. I'll then go through the dividend payments and see how much has been paid out. This is the seventh video update so far, I think, and it's been 27 months, which is over two years worth of video company portfolio building. And I've added 27 stocks so far since the channel portfolio began, all the way back in May 2018. For all of the newer subscribers, or anyone who hasn't been with the channel since the beginning, Here's what we have so far. In May, I added AT&T. In June, I added Barrett Developments PLC, which I've now sold. In July, I added Daimler, which I've now sold. In August, I added National Grid PLC. In September, I added Las Vegas Sands. In October, I added uh, General Mills. In November, I added Imperial Brands. In December, I added Royal Dutch Shell PLC. In January, I added International Paper. In February, I added TUI Group, which I've now sold. In March, I added BAE Systems PLC, which I've also now sold. In April, I added PacWest Bancorp. In May, I added Macy's Inc. In June, I added ING Group. I skipped July for reasons that I explained previously. In August, I added ABV Inc. In September, I added Aviva PLC. In October, I added IBM. In November, I added BT Group PLC. In December, I firstly added 7 Trent PLC and then added Pennon Group. And then in the next year, in January, I bought Rio Tinto. In February, I bought Carnival Cruise Lines. In March, I bought Caterpillar Inc. In April, I bought Leggett and Platt. And in May, I bought JP Morgan Chase. In June, I bought Tate and Lyle. And in July, finally, I bought Pfizer, as you've seen on the most recent Stock of the Month video. With every update video, the list of companies gets a little longer, obviously, and the length of the video will probably get longer and longer too. So I'm going to try and condense the info in this one, so hopefully we can get it to under 35 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. If you are invested in any of these companies specifically, then you can leave a comment or send an email if you have something to share or ask. I should be able to put timestamps in the description too, because it will allow you to check up on the companies you like specifically, and then you can skip the ones you don't really care about. Also, I'm going to put a timestamp to the income information too. Let's take a look at any significant updates for any of the companies. AT&T. This month, July, is going to be an important month for AT&T, as the Seeking Alpha article AT&T's Day of Reckoning is coming, says. July 3rd will be a big day for shareholders in telecommunications and entertainment giant AT&T. Before the market opens on that day, the company is slated to report financial results for the second quarter of its 2020 fiscal year. Though quarterly reports can often be humdrum events, this time around the picture should be a lot more interesting. For starters, it will give us a good idea to how the firm's newly launched HBO Max platform is faring. It will also provide a look into what could have been an incredibly volatile quarter for the firm, because of the fallout concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. HBO needs to be a big hitter this time round. Its launch was, in my opinion, pretty disappointing, and the price tag of the merger acquisition was humongous. The competition is on with Disney Plus and Netflix, and there are already impressive offerings. HBO Max doesn't need to be the top, but it really needs to be able to compete. I personally invest into AT&T as a kind of bond proxy based on the fact that it's a high yielding utility. So the earnings call should hopefully reflect that too. We want to see wider 5G rollout plans and no huge drop in subscribers to the main business side of the company. National Grid. Another bond proxy with National Grid here. You can probably sense a theme with the picking of the portfolio already if you're a new viewer. National Grid isn't exactly an exciting company and there isn't really much to say about it in terms of updates. Green energy is exciting though, and at least the stock market definitely thinks so. And National Grid PLC announced that it started construction on something called Viking Link, a high voltage electricity interconnector between Britain and Denmark. Viking Link is a joint venture between National Grid Ventures, part of National Grid, and Danish electricity system owner and operator, EnergyNet. This 1.4 gigawatt high voltage electricity interconnector will aid UK to provide clean power to nearly 1.5 million homes, 
as well as a substantially lower carbon footprint. This subsea electricity cable is expected to be functional from 2023. This electricity interconnector will be the longest in the world and stretch 475 miles between Lincolnshire in eastern England and South Jutland in Denmark. This project will involve an expenditure of £1.82 billion. Las Vegas Sands Las Vegas Sands took a big hit from being close to the epicentre, or alleged epicentre if you believe Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of the coronavirus. A big chunk of Las Vegas Sands revenue comes from Macau and being close to China did not treat this region well during the early stages of the pandemic. Subsequently, Las Vegas Sands management has decided to cut the dividend. As a primarily dividend-focused investor, I have to be pragmatic whenever a company cuts its dividend, and I have to decide whether or not to sell. Las Vegas Sands CEO Sheldon Adelson is a big dividend fan, so it's likely to be brought back soon. His catchphrase is, yay dividends, which seems a bit weird for an 86-year-old business tycoon, but it sounds promising for us dividend investors. An important thing to consider is that he is 86 years old and there may be a change in management soon for a multitude of reasons. So us shareholders will be looking to guidance from them if it does happen. Macau borders the Chinese mainland and the province of Guangdong, which is right next to Macau, took a step towards easing regulations and restrictions linked to coronavirus pandemic. Specifically, Guangdong loosened its quarantine requirement for those seeking to go to Macau, no longer requiring a 14-day lockdown for would-be visitors that effectively shut off the flow for visitors to Wynn and Las Vegas Sands Casino Resorts there. Personally, I see the dividend coming back within a year and a half to two years, so I'll be holding LVS, or Las Vegas Sands, as it is a top-quality casino company. General Mills General Mills has done exceptionally well in my portfolio so far. I bought it shortly after the Blue Buffalo acquisition. Originally, the market reacted badly to this, thinking it was a mistake. However, as time went on, the acquisition appeared synergistic and complemented the business as a whole, causing the stock price to rise. In addition, COVID-19-related lockdowns have caused people to stock up on dry and packaged goods, which is obviously something that General Mills excels in, so GIS shareholders saw some promising gains from that too. General Mills has struggled with competition from healthier and private label brands over the past few years, and to address those challenges, it divested its weaker brands, acquiring growing brands like the organic food maker Annie's, and refreshed its classic brands with new variants like Blueberry Cheerios, and expanded into the premium pet food market by buying Blue Buffalo. Unlike its rival Kraft Heinz, which cut costs to boost shipments, General Mills raised its prices to protect its margins. It also stuck to its holistic margin management plan, which cuts its operating expenses by installing energy-efficient technologies, optimising its distribution network, and reducing its packaging costs. These strategies enable General Mills to generate consistent earnings growth even after its organic sales growth stalled out and it suspended buybacks in 2018 to reduce debt after buying Blue Buffalo. As you'll see in the later section of this video, I am up about 50% in terms of capital gains, so I am seriously considering trimming this one, as it would take about, mm, about 12 years of dividend payments to match selling right now, and I'm not planning to buy more of this one to make it into a planet-sized position anyway. We'll see over the next few weeks what I decide to do, but I imagine this might be the last update that we see General Mills in the portfolio. Imperial Brands Imperial Brands cut its dividend, which was a little disappointing considering, as far as I know, it's the only one of the top five tobacco companies that have cut as a result of coronavirus. The article from Money Observer highlights a clear problem with owning tobacco companies. At the end of May, British American Tobacco South African Unit reported that it would relaunch an urgent legal action to challenge the country's ban on cigarette sales. BATS, BATS, which has a market share of nearly 80% in the country, warned that the ban threatened the survival of the local tobacco industry. This followed what had been a cautiously optimistic operational update in April, when British American Tobacco stated that following a strong operational performance in 2019, they expected to report earnings growth for 2020, despite the impact from COVID-19 being difficult to predict. The company added that most of its factories had remained open at full capacity and that had seen a limited impact on consumer demand, pricing or the ability of consumers to access products as a result of nationwide lockdowns implemented around the world. Meanwhile, the growth of ethical funds has also put selling pressure on tobacco stocks in general, with an announcement in early June from the UK's largest private sector retirement fund, the University's Superannuation Scheme, it would be divesting its tobacco holdings, which it said represented investments in a financially unsuitable sector. 
With governments looking to shut down or ban sales on cigarettes and investment funds shunning the shares from their holdings, this means that there could be some opportunity for depressed share pricing, which means higher yields for dividend investors. If, as a conscientious investor, you're looking way out to the future and imagining a world where cigarettes and tobacco no longer exist, I wouldn't blame you for selling and ignoring the sector completely. Royal Dutch Shell The biggest news for Royal Dutch Shell has been that the drop in oil prices that we talked about last update, and Shell is still clearly suffering from that. Shell has warned that significant adjustments to longer term oil price and interest rate expectations will result in impairments of $15 billion to $22 billion dollars, to the value of its assets in the second quarter. However, production and utilisation is now set to be at the higher end of April's expectations, or even above, across all divisions. In addition, there are concerns that oil prices may not rise in the near and even medium term. Royal Dutch Shell's chief executive said that the global economy will not achieve a V-shaped recovery after the coronavirus epidemic, which will curtail oil and gas demand for years. Ben van Buurden told in an online interview with IHS market chairman Dan Jurgen it was too early to know if demand for oil at peak energy demand and certainly mobility demand will be lower even when this crisis is more or less behind us and it will have a permanent knock for years he said the weaker demand outlook and subsequent drop in gas prices have meant that the likes of shell and others had to reduce spending sharply and postpone large amounts of investment for some time to come shell is the world's largest lng trader and had planned to increase its output in the coming years including in north america where natural gas has become abundant because of shale gas revolution. But Van Buurden said that major gas projects, such as the North American LNG plants, no longer look as strong as they did previously. For me, the biggest downside to this is the fact that low oil prices will give less cash to Shell in order to help its transition to renewable energy investments. What I'm looking for as a shareholder is to see Shell offer some divestments, and sell off assets that are lower performing to raise some cash to move towards this transition. Shell is currently looking to sell some plants in Egypt. International Paper International Paper has been hit a bit in recent months in my portfolio, and in terms of tax capital gains, I'm currently facing a paper loss. The company declared a quarterly dividend of $0.5125 per share for the period from July 1st on its common stock. This is in line with its previous dividend growth trajectory since 2012. So it's refreshing to see a company in my portfolio that hasn't cut as a result of COVID and resulting economic conditions for once. Analysts are pessimistic about international papers near-term prospects. In April, for example, KeyBanks lowered its price target on the stock to $29 from $38 and it maintained an underweight rating. And then in late May, An analyst at Deutsche Bank, Debbie Jones, shared her bearish opinion, lowering her price target to $40 from $46, while keeping a hold rating on the stock. A few weeks after that, Morgan Stanley joined in the fray, and initiating coverage on the stock with an underweight rating and assigning it to a $29 price target. The reason for this is that the coronavirus pandemic has affected paper consumption in schools, offices and businesses due to the stay-at-home measures implemented to contain the spread of the virus, and in turn, that strains the paper demand. The company has also witnessed unprecedented decline in commercial printing segments due to the significant pullback in print advertising. This will hurt the printing paper segment's performance in the near term. And further, the transition to digital media continues to affect paper demand. Paper printing is not doing well for the company, and for a company that's named International Paper, you may think this is going to be a death blow. International Paper, however, thankfully have other business interests and the company is witnessing robust demand driven by processed food, proteins, chemicals, tissue and towel in e-commerce. The company will continue to benefit from the growing e-commerce demand as it has become a primary spending channel for customers owing to the containment measures amid the pandemic. According to the free research from Zaxx, International Papers has been undergoing restructuring initiatives to transform itself into a core packaging company. The company has strategically offloaded businesses in China to focus more on its US operations. It believes it could cater to the Chinese and Asian markets more effectively by supplying global, by supplying globally competitive products, primarily through its Ilim joint venture in Russia, as well as through exports from the United States and other parts of the world. International Paper also completed the divestiture of its consumer packaging business in North America to graphic packaging holiday company GPK. The divestiture helped the company maximise the value of its North American consumer packaging business by combining it with the graphic packaging, 
while also focusing on its core business and strengthening the balance sheet. Mergers and acquisitions are a key strategy for international paper to strengthen its packaging business. In North America, the company envisions a large opportunity within its industrial packaging businesses, which continue to generate the best margins in the industry. The company is taking initiatives to, to drive further margin expansion across the business. I like the fact they're moving out of China, as although many see China as a vector for massive growth, tensions with the mainland against the US are really starting to heat up. International paper is something that I would consider adding more to in terms of my position on. I know it seems like I say that every update though. PacWest Bancorp. Last update, I mentioned the massive losses PacWest Bancorp had to its revenue due to being overweight in the hospitality sector. I said that it made plans to stop buyback program, but no mention at that time of the dividend being cut. Well, it turns out, shortly after the video was made, PacWest ended up cutting the dividend by 58%, from 60 cents a share to 25 cents a share. This is quite a big hit as PacWest was one of the higher yielding stocks in the portfolio, although it was only a small position. What's made more of an impact is the capital gains loss, which you'll see later on. PacWest forward yield is now about 5%, which is reasonable, but I'm wondering whether I should actually average down on my position. I've made the mistake of chasing down the, these losing companies as I average down into oblivion, so now I'm going to be more careful about it. The upside is that it's at decent value right now, all things considered, and buying would reduce my cost basis. However, I don't want to be trapped into making it a larger position than JP Morgan, which I bought recently, which I would consider a much stronger candidate for a planet-type position. The other thing to bear in mind is that at this price, PacWest moves into buyout territory for some of the bigger banks, so having a cost basis that's too high can be detrimental if the offer price is much lower than what I paid for it. All things considered, I'll think about averaging down, but it's not on my priority list as of right now. Macy's Macy's is still doing terrible, frankly, but what has really been a knife to the heart has been that the book value has been written down to $8 a share from $20 a share, which means that my original investing premise is completely demolished. All in all, Macy's may be a top 10 online retailer in the United States, but when it comes down to it, it's not an ideal dividend company. I'm looking to offload my Macy's shares in the near future. However, it will be a substantial loss on the portfolio balance sheet and a real loss, not just a paper loss. However, if I do sell General Mills, combined with the gains of BAE Systems, it'll be closer to zero. I don't see Macy's recovering at this point, so I'd probably just prefer to call it a day on Macy's and chalk it up to being a learning experience. ING Group. Nothing ever really happens with this one when I do an update video. As always, this company is pretty dependent on the EU bond rates and things like that. It's also looking to shut branches to move further towards digitization. It seems to be the same thing every update video, really. The dividend has been cut though, so although I am down far enough that it makes an attractive averaging down proposition, it's low on the list of priority position ads. Abvi Inc. Abvi has been doing well. Last update we saw how the Allegan acquisition ended up adding shareholder value, and now since Covid has ravaged almost the entire planet, pharmaceutical companies end up being the ones poised to benefit. Abvi is among the companies looking for coronavirus drugs among their current stable of treatments. Chinese authorities are using an AbbVie HIV treatment to address coronavirus-related pneumonia. Coletra, also known as Alluvia, contains antiviral components that block the virus replication. Although not yet approved as treatment for the coronavirus, Coletra has shown efficacy across multiple trial cases. However, AbbVie gave up some of its potential when it announced in April that it wouldn't defend patent rights to Coletra. In the event that Coletra does prove effective against COVID-19, the move would allow competitors to create additional supply to satisfy demand that Abvi alone can't meet. So the company will benefit from being able to sell some of its portfolio of drug products to help treat coronavirus, but also help the world by offering it to other manufacturers to help get the medicine out more quickly. Abvi also has potential for organic growth through cancer drugs in Bruvica and Venclexta, immunology drugs Rinvoc and Skyrizi. All in all, Abvi does have some potential to grow, and yields a respectable sum. I'm up a lot on Abvi though, so I don't know what the best strategy is. I'm not sure whether to sell it off now and take the capital gains, or just to leave it in the portfolio and keep getting those high yielding dividends. If in doubt, it's probably best just to hang on to it. Aviva Inc. Aviva reported an increase in both life and general insurance sales during the first quarter of the year, up 28% and 3% respectively. 
The growth was driven by bulk annuity sales in the early part of the quarter and strong growth in the Canadian general insurance business. The company estimates 160 million of additional general insurance claims stemming from the coronavirus outbreak after accounting for reinsurance. And Aviva's investment portfolio continues to perform well, with just 3% of the portfolio seeing its credit rating downgraded by a letter. In other news, Wealthify is now fully owned by Aviva PLC, so that's some good news. I'm still waiting for this one to reinstate its dividend, and I have since increased my holding of Aviva, as it fell quite far, but it still remained a good value in my opinion. IBM IBM is still paying a dividend, which is a good thing, although its actual figures aren't that amazing despite still attempting a turnaround of the business. Investors have been disappointed with International Business Machine Corporation's poor strategic initiatives, underwhelming operating performance, and incessant headcount reductions, all of which have led the company to give shareholders cumulatively negative total. There are five key points where IBM has shown weakness. IBM's turnaround has been slow and continues to lag industry peers. IBM actually lost money on a pre-tax basis in quarter one. Financing leases and receivables are deteriorating and losses are rising. Stock compensation is up 50% despite underwhelming results and balance sheet weakening on increased goodwill and financial leverage. I bought this as it was a strong yield and I believe the acquisition of Red Hat could help with its turnaround strategy. That being said, IBM's new CEO told Wall Street Journal in early May that he believes the marketplace adoption of hybrid cloud technology is only about 20% complete and that the adoption of AI is about 4% complete. And the coronavirus might have helped speed up the broader transition. At the time of making this video, IBM has not yet released its earnings, so that will be an important thing to look at as to whether I think this company still has potential. On the dividend side of things, the dividend has been increased again, so there's positive news from that perspective. BT Group, PLC. The biggest BT news is the uproar about Huawei and Chinese interference in UK telecommunications. Huawei equipment was originally limited to 35% of UK network, but has since been reduced to zero by 2027. This indicates a big cost to BT, although the time frame is a slight relief. Howard Watson, BT's chief technology officer, told UK officials last week that a total 5G ban would cost his business up to £600 million in a rip and replace fees. The operator said the entire overhaul could be done for £500 million, his previous cost estimate of a cap restricting Huawei to 35% of the 5G network. The explanation seems to be the late deadline of 2027 for the removal of Huawei from the operator's 5G networks. Over such a long period, companies will be replacing network equipment in any case, meaning the incremental costs are relatively low. Gone too are the warnings about service disruption, including blackouts. We believe the timescales outlined will allow us to make these changes without impacting on the coverage, or resilience of our existing networks, said Philip Jansen, BT's CEO, in a statement. It's now insisting that a ban will not seriously upset its original 5G ambitions, even though it had warned authorities of delays if Huawei was shut out, regardless of the timescale for its eviction. The government move, said Jansen, will allow us to continue our rollout of 5G and full fibre networks without a significant impact on the timescales we've previously announced. BT does not currently pay a dividend, and may not do until a couple of years from now. I'm holding this one as I believe it will be a strong dividend pair when it gets back to business and gets rid of its pension issues. 7 Trent PLC Water companies are another type of company that is very boring, but that's what makes them really great additions to the portfolio. They just sit there and pay dividends. Hargreaves Lansdowne says that 7 Trent's per first quarter has been in line with expectations and full year guidance remains unchanged. The group still expects coronavirus to have a negative impact of 50 to 85 million pounds on revenue this financial year. However, the regulatory mechanism will allow Seven Trent to recoup this in 2022 or 2023. Cash collection from customers has been broadly in line with the last year, but the group expects bad debts to rise as UK furlough schemes start coming to an end. I'll be holding for now, no need to add until the portfolio is a bit bigger. Pen and Group Revenue from Pennon's continuing water operations finished the year marginally higher at £636 million. Profit before tax fell 4.1% to £193 million, reflecting pressure on margins and an increase in exceptional costs, including provision for non-payment of bills in relation to coronavirus. Virador, the group's recycling business, whose sale to private equity KKR is nearly complete and generated revenue of £757 million, and profit before tax of £104 million.
Pennon announced a final dividend of 30 pence, bringing the total payment this year to 43.77 pence, 6.6% higher than last year. Pennon plans to distribute some Viridor sales proceeds to shareholders, but will confirm these details at a later date. The group's dividend policy for 2020 to 2025 regulatory period is to increase the dividend by at least 2% of inflation. That's a drop from the current policy of paying out 4% and above. So a little disappointing in terms of dividend growth, but still at a rate above inflation is acceptable for a company that I don't see growing much in size. Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto had some issues in Canadian and South American mines due to quarantine rules and only recently starting to see the effects of that. An uneven global recovery from the coronavirus pandemic and concern over the prospects for second waves of infections are weighing on the outlook across commodities markets, according to the Rio Tinto Group. While demand is strong in China, the top raw materials consumer, the US copper market remains weak, the aluminium sector is being challenged by sluggish auto sales, and there's likely to be a muted rebound in Europe and Japan, even as they ease virus curbs. If I look at the Chinese situation, the recovery is well underway and the country is experiencing a V-shaped rebound supporting iron ore and bauxite, Rio's chief executive officer, Jean-Sebastien Jax, said in a phone interview. I'm not quite sure on what letter of the alphabet I should pick for the other countries, he said. We're starting to see some signs of recovering construction and automotive in the US and in Europe, but it is slow. A second wave of infections remains a key threat for advanced economies, according to Rio, which this month announced the closure of loss-making aluminium smelter in New Zealand and said the future of another operation in Iceland remains under review. The uncertainty in the marketplace is because there is no doubt. It's not a question of it. It's a question of when. And we will have a second wave of COVID-19, Jack said, speaking from Cape York in, in northern Queensland, where he was making his first visit to an operation in four months as travel curbs ease in some parts of Australia. Commodity suppliers could seek to boost raw material shipments to China, with the demand recovery slower elsewhere and the nation already lifting imports of iron ore and copper concentrate. Tensions between Australia and China post-Covid are a little problematic for iron ore and Rio Tinto's mines potentially, so I am apprehensive of how that goes. I would definitely buy more Rio Tinto and I'm vying for it to become a planet position on the portfolio. However, it's not big enough to say that just yet. Carnival Cruise Lines Carnival has been set back by another sailing ban, which is a little scary for shareholders as it's burning through cash that it obtained from its high interest debt. At 4pm Thursday, just as trading closed on the stock market, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or also known as CDC, announced that it has extended the no-sale order and suspension of further embarkation through to September the 30th. This means, in essence, that no cruise line will be able to sail out of an American port before that date unless either the Secretary of Health and Human Services declares that COVID-19 no longer constitutes a public health emergency, or a CDC director otherwise rescinds or modifies the no-sale order based on specific public health or other considerations. I'm down a lot on Carnival, and this sailing ban has been a big setback in my plan to regain capital gains on the shares I currently own. Not looking to sell at current prices, but I don't see a dividend coming back for about three years, So if prices somehow rose in the next few months, I would consider selling at a smaller loss than I am right now, but ideally, I plan to hang on for the near term. Caterpillar. I bought Caterpillar just as the markets were dipping, which in retrospect was great timing, but not really from my own control. Bank of America upgraded Caterpillar shares to neutral from underperform, with a $135 price target, boosted from $95, noting that most economic data has been surprising to the upside, and a recent survey of construction dealers was not as bad as we expected. Bank of America analyst Ross Gallardi expects Caterpillar will remain downbeat on demand trends when it reports Q2 results later this month, but he thinks the stock can keep up with the market as long as consensus estimates aren't going down anymore. Caterpillar is just a solid dividend stock that I'm glad I found an opening with. I'm not really looking to add any more at this moment. Leggett and Platt. Leggett and Platt has been a bit of a wild ride with many analysts discussing their will they, won't they, on cutting their dividend. Leg ended up declaring a 40 cents share quarterly dividend, which is in line with previous. This means if it raises over the space of next year, it will maintain its status as dividend king and aristocrat. Not an exciting company, but should hopefully continue to provide dividend income. JP Morgan. JP Morgan earnings per share have enjoyed double digit gains for the past eight quarters. That all came to a halt in April when the bank's first quarter earnings per share plunged 71%. 
In the second quarter, they fell 51%. Analysts expect JP Morgan's earnings to slide 48% in 2020 overall, after climbing 19% in 2019. JP Morgan and its large bank peers have set aside billions to cover souring loans, as the pandemic shutdowns of the economy threatens people's ability to keep up with bill payments. The CFO, during the bank's second quarter earnings call in July, said the economy will confront a moment of truth in the months ahead, after coronavirus-related stimulus efforts offered only temporary relief for individuals and businesses. Savings are up, incomes are up, house prices are up, Diamond said. You will see the effect of this recession. You're just not going to see it right away. So a rough ride in store for US economy and big banks like JPM are going to bear the brunt of that. Not currently planning to buy at these prices, however if it dips as a result of the recession, I would consider it as I'm buying for the super long term with this one. Tate and Lyle and Pfizer. I only recently bought these so I'll have to wait for another update video to find out what they get up to. Now we've done a summary of the stock so far, we can take a look at how the market has reacted to them and see what prices they're currently trading at. Are they up or are they down right now? It's not looking that great if I'm honest, as the bigger positions are the ones with the losses, so it weighs the whole portfolio down. But that's just how it goes, I guess. So, how are they all doing since I bought them? Okay, I'll load them up in alphabetical order rather than the order I bought them, just because it's easier to go through on the platform. Okay, first up, AbV is up 50%. Definitely a great pick back when I got it, and the market reaction to the Allegan merger just seems like a beautiful gift looking back. It would be a nice bonus to sell now, but it still yields about 5%, so it's not even worth selling realistically. AT&T down a little bit, but not really significantly. If it does fall, I would add more to the point where it becomes a planet-sized position in the portfolio, almost certainly. Aviva down 10%, which is better than it has been in the time I owned it. Down 10% represents about £200. Looking for the dividend to come back as soon as realistically possible for this one. BT Group PLC down a lot. I'm not sure why it shows a yield percentage there, as it's not paying a dividend and won't be for a while. Carnival down almost 50%, so that's a big contributor to the total portfolio losses, and they could really do with getting back to started with safe cruises before this one all rise up again. Caterpillar, like I said, was a was really just a right stock, right time type purchase, and that's up now 30%. I only have 10 shares, but I wish I had more, just like everyone who has hindsight. General Mills, another one up 50%, currently yielding 3%, which is a bit low in terms of my aims, so it's likely that that will be sold soon. Imperial Brands is a big position and down 30%, which isn't good to see. I think there's only been one update where it's been remotely close to neutral. It's a big dividend payer though, as we'll see in the next section, ING Group. I feel like this one just sits in the portfolio and even more now that it's cut its dividend. IBM down almost 10%, which isn't bad considering the risk we talked about in the earlier chapter, yielding a decent amount still too. International paper is down 20%, and I am considering adding more to this one. Okay, that's most I can fit on one screenshot, so I'll load up the second part. And JP Morgan actually up, but not by much. Las Vegas Sands down about 15%, which again isn't too bad considering its proximity to COVID-19 and not being a necessary service by any means. Leggett and Platt up 30%, which is nice. I wonder what that would be looking like if they did cut their dividends, though. Macy's, I hate to see it still here, and it's down by 60%, which is pretty dreadful by anyone's measure. National Grid up 10%, nothing spectacular here, and it's ex-dividend too, so we're going to see a nice dividend coming in the near term. PacWest Bancorp down 50%. This means that I can triple my holding just by paying the same amount I originally paid for the shares, which is an interesting idea for me to do. Penning Group up 18%. And a lot of that was from selling its waste management business off. Pfizer only recently bought it, so it's nice to see it's actually up, even if it's only 3%. Rio Tinto up 10%. I'll guess that's from the quick recovery of China's economy. Shell down 40%. Already very heavy on this one, but I would like to make it all the way up to 500 shares. Seven Trent up 5%, which is good. Not expecting massive gains from any of my utilities. Tate and Lyle got hit recently, even though I only just bought it, which is disappointing. And if we look all the way down to the bottom, we can see the total values. Now I've added a decent amount since last time, so although the portfolio has recovered by £500, the percentage recovery is much better. Now I'm only looking down a 15% loss, which of course is not really a good thing, but it is what it is. As I said earlier, this is mostly due to the bigger positions being in the negative, rather than the whole portfolio being at a loss. 
It also doesn't include dividend payments, which we'll look at in the next part of the video, and it also doesn't include the profits of stocks that I've already sold. Actually, it doesn't mean a huge amount unless I sell everything right now. It doesn't exactly look or feel good, though. What do you think about the performance of these stocks after 27 months? Are any surprising to you? I'd be interested to know your thoughts, so make sure to leave a comment. Now let's move on to the most important, and my favourite part of the video, the dividend income. Just how much has been returned to me so far this year? Let's take a look. Okay, I'll load that up now. And last time we saw the portfolio, we saw the payments in April, and we saw the massive payment in March too, so let's start from May. Got five payments in May. General Mills paid me £9.95, AT&T paid £17.60, Abvi paid £20.32, um, Caterpillar Inc paid £7.09, Packwest Bangkok paid £5.91, and the total for May was £60. A nice chunk, but still a little low month for May. Four payments in June. IBM paid £10.86, International Paper £10.28, Shell paid £41.21, and Imperial Brands paid £62.55. The total for June was £124.90, which is a nice amount to get that I'll reinvest back into the portfolio. It's not fully through July yet, so we will recap it next update. But so far, there have already been two payments. Leggett and Platt paid £13.41, and Seven Trent paid £30.03, which is sizable as we're about halfway through the month. Overall, I'm obviously very happy with these payments. Due to the fact that many companies have started cutting their dividends, at least temporarily, I still think March will be the highest month we see all year, just as I predicted last update, but hopefully we can still reach that end of year target. If we look at the total income for 2020 so far, it's almost £100 off the entire 2019's year's worth already, which demonstrates the exponential power of continuing to invest and compound dividends despite the cuts. Now let's look at the monthly average earnings, which is £126.70. That's actually less than the last update, which is super disappointing to see. But as March was a huge payment disproportionately compared to the rest, it kind of skewed the average in that direction. In addition, there have been a number of cuts to the portfolio which have hurt the average as well. I'm hoping that by next update, it'll be higher. Now I hope this was interesting for you, and remember the next update will be in three months. I'm expecting some big payments over the next few months, so definitely check back in for that. It's not too long to wait to see what will happen next and what stocks I've added and how they're all doing. Remember, none of this channel constitutes financial advice, so follow at your peril. If you think that the dividend experiment is interesting, then please feel free to subscribe. It's free and you'll be notified when I buy new stocks. I'm also curious about your take on the experiment portfolio so far. Would you have done anything differently yourself? As always, thanks for watching. I know this one's been a long one, so I do appreciate it, and I hope to see you on the next video. See ya!